This is my first video, so y'all bear with me. What I'm going to try to do is show how I make a dizzy bowl using the Ringmaster. What I have here is a glued up blank. That's 12 by 12, well a little bit over. I've drawn a circle 12 inches in diameter. The blank is one and a fourth inches thick and what I hope to do is take it to the bandsaw and get me five panels out of it that a measure of thickness of somewhere between one eighth and three sixteenths of an inch. So I'll do that now. Take it to the bandsaw, cut my circle, and then we'll slice the uh, panels. Okay, I've cut my circle. It's 12 inches in diameter. I've drawn a reference line down here so I can orientate my five panels I'm going to cut in the same direction. I'm going to put a uh, block up under there and drill me a, three, a half inch hole. Okay, now I'm going to take it to the bandsaw and slice my panels. I'll readjust the camera. Okay, what I've done is I've mounted my blank on my Acro Slice uh, jig attachment here with double sided tape. Now, the Acro Slice, you can read about it on their website. It allows me to cut the same thickness. Uh, panels without any uh, blade drift. Also has a dial indicator over here which I can dial in the repeated same thicknesses. On this one I'm going to cut the panels at uh, four and a half turns which will be uh, 50 thousandths per turn. But on the outer panels I want them to be just a little bit thicker because once I glue them together I'm going to have to sand them down. I don't want to sand away material. So I'm going to cut them about five and, uh, and the middle piece will be four and a half. So let me dial that in. Let's cut these back. Well, my memory card filled up after I made that first slice on the uh, acro slice over there. So uh, I went ahead and did the others talking to myself. What I did though was I cut two the inside two outside rings at five turns on my index wheel. The index wheel a complete turn is a uh, fifty thousandth of an inch. So I ended that's a that'd be a fourth of an inch. So when you take away from the blade, I ended up with two cuts that are a little over 2200s. 
of an inch. On the inside, I turned my index wheel four and a half times and cut three rings with that. When you take away from the blade, I ended up with three rings that's a little over eighteenth hundred of an inch. Now what I'll do is sand these down to uh, the middle ones to uh, fifteen hundredths of an inch and the outside I'll leave like this, same thickness when I glue them up. And then once it's glued, I'll plane and sand these down on my disc sander to, uh, excuse me, drum sander to uh, a total thickness of uh, three fourths of an inch. Now to glue these up, I use a little jig. Helps me uh, glue them up and align them. I've did this pattern before, and I had a lot of trouble uh, lining things up because uh, there's only four colors in here, and it's really hard to follow a reference. So I made a little change. I put me my Wingay dark strips here on the inside uh, next to the white. And then I put my cherry strips on the outside next to the red. They was vice versa on the other one. It was hard to see the pattern. This lets me follow this here. To further aid, I drew me a reference line down the middle. Now you line these up any way you want to in the pattern, but I like to move mine over on this particular one anyway, about a half of an inch, like that, and that, and that, and that. What I've done is put this uh, uh, Wingate strip on, on the inside here, on the inside of the next one, as you can see there. Alright, to clamp these down, I'll have this top thing, and I'll screw this down. Now I find that on these long panels, like wide panels like this, the pressure is all in the middle and I don't get too much on the outside. So to stop it from curling and to get good pressure there, I'll add four of these clamps on the outside. then we'll let that dry. Now this is the dry fit. When I glue up the, uh, when I do the permanent one with the glue on it, I'll only glue one panel at a time. That way I don't get the slippage. It gives it a chance to set up. So what I'll do is take these apart, take them to the uh, drum sander, sand them down to the thickness I want, bring them back over, glue them up, let them dry, and then we'll come back and uh, turn some rings. This is a small one that I had glued up, uh, made several months ago. It's, I liked it, so that's why I decided to build another one. I like the colors on that. Well, I've got the board glued up. I've ran it through the planer and the uh, disc sander, got it to a uniform thickness here, but I find that no matter how hard we try with these hobby tools we have, we can't get it completely parallel 
all the way across. So what I like to do is take a average. I like to do it in five different places to come up with a figure that I can use to determine my angle and my PAG. That's 78.8. Uh, excuse me, 7, 0.788. That was 0 0.790. Seven nine one. What's about gone on that pencil? Seven nine three. If you get an average of these, then you can use that figure. That's fairly uniform and it works good for your PAG or your angle setting. Now I've got a uh, program, an uh, Excel program I created that I, on my cell phone that I use. Uh, it gives me a lot more information than just this. I'd like you to see that, so I'm going to take you in the house and put you and uh, do it on the computer. Uh, that way you'll be able to see it. This is an Excel program that I've made to help me uh, do the math and make decisions on my settings for my ringmaster. The way it works is I put the average averages that I got off my board, five of them, here. It'll put the average here and it'll also show me the angle and the PAG for all these possible settings that I use on my ringmaster. Now the ringmaster comes standard with the 5 sixteenths and the 3x index plate. If you use anything above that, bear in mind that you're going to have to put them on the lathe to turn them. The 5 sixteenths and the 3h are designed for sanding your bowls. Anything above that is too thick to sand down to a reasonable thickness. So you'll have to put it on your lathe. Okay, let me show you how this works. I put the averages that we readings that we took on that board I just measured out here and the first one was 0.788 the next one was 0 0.790 0 0.794 0 0.791 and 0 0.793 now that done all the math that we need to do. It gave me the average thickness of my board of 0.791. It gave me the angles for all these five different settings. It also gave me the PAG for all these five different settings. Now, any of you don't know what a PAG is, it's a precision angle guide. It's an instrument used to set the angle on your ringmaster lathe. In the next segment you'll see me using the PAG. Okay, now I like a thickness on my bows around 35 degrees. I mean an angle on my board around 35 degrees. That just gives me a more open bow, the more open bow that I like. To get that I'd have to, I can use either a half inch or a 5 8 inch. I think I'll use the 5 8 inch. I like a 38 inch angle a little better for what I'm wanting to do than a 32 inch angle. It'll give me a sort of a more open look. Notice that if I use the 5 16 inch index with this 0.791 bowl, my angle would only be 21 and a half degrees. 
that angle would be almost straight up. There's no curve to it. So I like, I, I'm going to use this one over here. I like that one. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, is uh, get, that, get the figures here and take them out to the uh, lathe and uh, cut, a, cut some rings. Our bore is 7.91 inches thick. We're going to use a 5 8 inch index. We're going to have a 38.31 degree angle. And our PAG setting is going to be 2.370. Let's take that information and go to the shop. Well, we've got the ring, uh, the board mounted on the ring master. The only thing I didn't show you was a reference line that I drew across up there so that uh, I can orientate all these rings in the same direction. We decided that our PAG was going to be uh, set that on the cream master. Now what that PAG represents is a hypothesis of a triangle that's 5 8 inches in this direction and 0 0.791 inches in this direction. So if this board in fact is 0.791 inches and an angle is correct and our PAG is 2.37 then this gap here should fit perfectly which it does. Now the blade on my, the cutters on my machine are, are 1 and 1 16th inches apart centered. If any of these factors is off then this is not going to fit properly and you're going to have to adjust the cutters to make, make it work. For example, if the angle's off just a tad, let's say, let's say I've got two degree angle, well let's say one and a half degree angle off. then the board don't fit between the cutters because now my hypothesis has changed and my angle is, is different and it won't fit on there. This fits in that. So if any of them factors are your board thickness, your angle, your cutters, it ain't going to work. You're going to have to adjust the cutters. That's the reason I take such care in flatten in my board so that things fit. Now let me adjust my index plate. This don't take so long for not running my mouth. Tighten my plate down. And we'll make a cut.
This is a waste piece. I usually take a piece of sandpaper. There's a little ridge right there. Okay, now I'm using Bob's index plate, so mine's exactly uh, uh, 5 8 inches. If you're using the 5 6 inch index plate, you'd have to skip a hole. Thank <laughs> you. 
Guess I didn't get it all the way through. All the rings are cut and stacked up here. This is the way they look. Didn't turn out too bad. What we're going to do now is uh, prepare these for uh, gluing. I'm going to sand the bottoms on each one of these. Uh, make sure I got a good tight fit when I glue them up. Then I'm going to show you how. Uh, how I go about gluing them up. I'm a little unorthodox when that when it comes to glue up, but you'll see how that works out. <clears throat> okay, I like to sand my uh, pieces on this uh, this disc I put on my lathe here versus uh, a sanding board because it's a lot faster, a lot easier, and does a better job. I also like to use this over the uh, uh, disc sander because the disc sander turns at 1750 RPMs. If your fingers slip, that'll take that meat right down to the bone. This one here turn at about a 100 RPM. It won't, it won't hurt you. It'll just push your hand out of the way. Now take my disc. I just sand the bottoms of them on this. I'll get the tops when I, when I uh, glue up one. I'll show you how that works. So it just takes a light touch. I usually do it in several places. The board's fairly flat when I, when I started with, so I'm just trying to get the uh, fuzzies off of there. And I'll do that for all of my pieces. If it is a little bit off, then it this will flatten them up. And notice I got a chip out here all the way across. That's going to cause me some problems when I go to sand that up. It's uh. We'll have to see how to work how that works. Now the way I like to do my dizzy bows is to mount them on a solid bottom plate. This way here I can mount this, then I'll glue up my rings onto that. That way I can turn away the center of this and won't have a hole in here. I've already prepared this blank here and I've put a recess in the bottom to mount it on the lathe and I've completely finished this. I've sanded it and uh, put lacquer on it so that all I have to do is sign my name and it's ready to go. I won't have to return to this again.
to, to center this, I put a little dial, half inch dial in my chuck here. And what I'll do is mount that on the hole here, like that. Now when I advance that up, it'll be centered. Let me get the glue. more glue than I needed. Alright, we'll let that dry and then we'll come back Show you how to square this off and start building the uh, rings. This is my glue up station. What I use is uh, this contraption here is called a segmenting stomper. It's, I use it for gluing up my segmented rings, but I found that I also like to use it for uh, my ringmaster rings. What it does is plunges down and centers your piece. The way it works is I can take the bottom piece that I'm fixing the glue to, mount it in here, take my Longworth chuck to the bottom of it, which centers that, then I take this piece here, which is the bottom piece that I just put the uh, glue, glue to uh, ring on. I'll put me a little dial in here to go in this hole here. All right, and then just stomp it down, and then line it up. Like that. Of course, I'll put glue on it, then weigh it down, let it set. So let's do that. Now there's other jigs for gluing up these segmented rings, but I like this one. The main reason is this workbench is lower than my workbench over there, and I can actually look down on the pattern and uh, see to line it up better. That's important when you're doing a complicated pattern like this one. Now what I do is I'll let this set up. just. Just set up a little bit so that I can move it. Then I'll put it back on the lathe, and I'll actually turn it on the some on the lathe. Then I'll turn that bottom out, which I was talking about. So let this set up about five minutes, and I'll come back. I let that sit on the glue up station over there for four or five minutes. Then I moved it over here to the lathe and applied tailstock pressure to it and let it sit here for about 15 minutes. Now that should be good enough for me to do some turning to it now. I'm not going to do much turning, at least to the sides, but what I'm going to do is turn away this middle all the way down to this solid base plate I got. I'm going to do it now why it's easy to get to, easy to reach.
all the way down to the solid bottom there. It's exposed there about 5 8 inches or so. Now I'm going to do a little bit on the sides here. I'll be turning a little bit off the sides as I go each ring as I as I progress up I'm not doing it to uh, turn it to a final thickness yet what I'm doing is just trying to even it out so it's balanced turns are good because when I get way out here on the end if I don't have this back part balanced I'm gonna be all out of shape and it's gonna be really hard to turn then so I do it now tear out there from my cutters on my ringmaster. So I'll get it out now. That cut I was just making wasn't a scraping cut, it was a, a sheer cut I guess you'd call it. I'm riding the bevel I'm pulling it up like this, riding my bevel and cutting with this edge here. The way that works is I just, you can't see it over there, I know I just touch my bevel to it like that, and then just kind of roll the uh, tool in until it starts to cut, and then I pull it. Picked up the cut and now I'm just bringing it up. And that's cutting away the fiber. That's how you get out, uh, tear out. You cut it out, you can't scrape it out. Well, that's pretty good. Now, that's, that thickness right there is about a half, about a half inch. So I'm I'm not going to leave it at that. I want to turn it down to uh, probably about five sixteenths. That's about like a like I like them. I want to I want it to have some meat in there so it'll feel substantial, but I don't want it this thick. I'm just making sure that's flat. You see how that rides without bouncing? That's telling me that that's flat. It's parallel. It's ready to sand. Okay, so we finished up over there and you can see I've got it fairly smooth inside, outside, no tear out. And uh, it's turned all the way down to this base plate. So now what we're going to do is mount another ring, same technique, put it on here, rotate it around, find my, find my uh, pattern, glue it down. enough glue on that at time for three rings. So let's take some of it off.
Okay, we'll let that sit for four or five minutes, just to get tacky, then I'll take it over the lathe, apply pressure to it again. Then I'll turn the inside and the outside just enough to make it smooth, uh, not to get it down to final thickness. Okay, this uh, ring here has been on there for about 15 to 20 minutes with the tail stock up to it with a lot of pressure, so it should be dry enough to turn now. I've got a little tear out right in here and a little right on here, it looks like the end grain. That's from the uh, from the cutters on the ring master. Probably needed to sharpen them. This right here is a ring that uh, had that I called it a chip, but it went all the way across. So rather than trying to sand it down, that'd be taking away too much wood, I went ahead and filled it with some uh, wood putty. So I'm going to do some turning to this now. But I'm not trying to turn this again to the finished size. I'm just trying to even the walls up, like I said earlier, to make sure that it's balanced when it gets way out here. So I'll just take a little bit away just enough to make it true to That's the end of this ring, ring, uh, ring master bowl. Yeah, that is not repairable. Well, even though we didn't uh, get to finish the uh, dizzy bowl, I think we've accomplished our objective. I set out to show how I make a dizzy bowl using the ring master to cut the rings. I think I've done that. I started off by showing the glued up block and how I sliced the panels. Then I showed how I glued the panels to get the swirl pattern that makes it a dizzy bowl. Then we cut the rings on the ring master, and then I showed how I glued and turned the rings. Now we didn't get to finish that, we had four more rings to go, but all that was left to do was those four rings to turn it down to size and then finish. I think you can live without that, and I think you got the gist of how I built that dizzy bowl. So I'm going to call it mission accomplished.
all wasn't lost either. I took that bottom part that I, that broke off, and I turned this little finger dizzy bowl out of it. Somebody might get a use out of that. And I'm going to take this part over here. I'm going to glue it up and put a bottom in it. Maybe a southwest design like an Indian blanket or something. Then we can call it a southwest dizzy bowl or dizzy southwest bowl or something. We'll get something out of it. Okay guys, if you uh, stuck with this video this long, then I want to applaud your patience. And I hope somebody will get something out of this. Happy turning.